Recovery is stupendous. Achievable. Hope. Freedom. 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 Empowering. It's unique to everyone. It's a journey, not a destination. Getting a new lease on life. It's finding restoration after you fall down. Recovery is having the freedom to enjoy life. For me, it was finding a way to really love myself. My recovery is possible in part because of my own sense of purpose. Welcome to Montana's Peer Network Recovery Talks podcast. I'm Jim Haney. And I'm Mandy Nunes. And today we have an extra special guest on our podcast, Alicia. She's my fiance. And we're going to spend a little time talking about healthy relationships and recovery and what what that looks like in an LGBTQ relationship and um, our kids and kind of all of the ripples um, of healthy relationships and recovery. Yeah, yeah. Every every February, we pick relationships as a topic in honor of Valentine's Day. And uh, we've been talking about this one for quite a while. And I'm looking forward to it. Um, I always look forward to the February podcast um, where we just pick the one topic and talk about all the elements of recovery and relationships, you know. So this is really cool. And I'm I'm really happy that um, Alicia, you agreed to come on and yeah. uh, and it's great. It's it's really great. So uh, I know in the warmups, we got some good, good stuff. Yeah. You know, I'm excited. Yeah. yeah. It's good, good to get it out there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So where do we want to jump in? Where do you guys want to start off with? You want to start off with how you, how you are today with their relationship and you want to jump in there and talk about that? I mean, we had dated in the past and mm -hmm. uh, it was super early recovery, like months after we both had gotten clean and, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, there's that stigma of don't date in the first, like, Right, right. <laughs> Month or right, whatever. Right, right. The first year, don't don't yeah. talk to anybody. You know? And uh, I mean, I, I kept that in mind, but I also wanted to be loved. Exactly. <laughs> and, and then there was Mandy. <laughs> and then there was me. And I also really wanted to be loved. Um, yeah, yeah. And I was, um, I was really needy. <laughs> at that point in my recovery sure. um and you know i i had not learned i had not learned all of the coping skills that i've learned today i had not learned how to even take care of myself yet really mm -hmm. like i was working a part-time job at pita pit um i was living in um a sober living home. I was in treatment court. I was doing UAs all the time. There was mm -hmm. so much of what I was doing that really needed to be and was mm -hmm. this, this focus on healing myself and my own life. Mm -hmm. And she had all of her own stuff going on, which I'll let her talk about. Mm -hmm. um, and then we tried to like blur this stuff together and find, find love in that place. And it, I wouldn't say it was super, super toxic like past relationships that we had had but we weren't healthy enough individuals yet mm -hmm. to create any kind of foundation to like build a long-term stable healthy relationship on and so mm -hmm. it just didn't it didn't work out initially I don't know what are what do you want to talk about what you had going on I mean I was in um intensive outpatient treatment five days a week Mm -hmm. uh, trying to do part-time work, also mm -hmm. trying to still um, raise my children. And I was living in my parents' house with my children. And mm -hmm. it just, um, there was a lot of work that needed to be done. But I, like I said, just wanted to be loved. And mm -hmm. um, I, I wasn't finding that in the work that I was doing to get myself clean. And it just, it just felt like I needed that extra little spark, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Did you know, did, did either of you recognize in the beginning that you weren't, you weren't ready, you know, for a relationship or did that come later? I think it came later. Um, of course I had lots of people telling me like, just 
keep it in the front of your mind, like what's going on and what yeah. you need to do to get yourself yeah. uh, some stability. And I think that also definitely made me realize kind of towards the end of our relationship the first time was that, okay, I think maybe most of these people are right. Like we have a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That we came towards the end because I was very confident that I was ready for a relationship. <laughs> and, um, yeah. and and I was not. I mean, and it was. It's. I mean, we found love in a twelve-step meeting. We found, and actually, it was. Mm -hmm. They have these dances, right? And so. I had seen her in, in the room mm -hmm. and I was like, she's cute, you know? Mm -hmm. And then we went mm -hmm. to this dance and went out to eat. A big group of us went out to eat afterwards and yeah. I was totally flirting with her and she was- Had no idea. So <laughs> You had no idea? <laughs> no idea. She even uh, gave a number at the end of the night and I still was like, oh, okay. And then gave my number to like the rest of the group that was there because I was still really new. Right. And <laughs> I still just had no idea. Because you were thinking it was within the context of recovery. Yeah. Like people exchange numbers like, hey, if you need support, call me. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. That's good. <laughs> that That's good. So so you, you guys try this relationship. It doesn't work. You're not ready. And I, and I think that's I mean, that's really common. I, I mean, it, you know, people it's like like Alicia, like you said, I mean, people want to be loved. And I think when you first start that road of recovery, the, the treatment system, the behavioral health system, you know, is just like, don't have relationships, you know, just, but it's not very realistic. Like it's better, in my opinion, it's better to talk about it and sort of put it out on the table and educate people. And then people can make their own choices than to just say, you know, the standard is like one year, right? Like one year, don't, but very few people follow that <laughs> because <laughs> We, we're, we're, we're human beings and we want to be loved. We want to have sex. We want to feel compassion. You know, we want to be in a relationship. We want to mm -hmm. be able to share this very difficult time in er especially early recovery. Yes. We want to share that with other people. Right. And, and <clears throat> I know it complicates things mm -hmm. <laughs> as it did yes. for you. Mm -hmm. Right. But at the same time, people are going to go do it anyway. So if we don't talk about it, if we don't put it out there and, and give people at least the space, like if you're going to IOP, at least have the space to allow people to discuss that kind of thing. I, I went to, I did the same thing early in my recovery, went to intensive outpatient. You know, there was no talk about relationships, <laughs> zero, you know, and it's like, what, what am I going to be celibate the rest of my life? Like, is that the deal with recovery? Like, you know, so like, I just think that's an area that we as people in recovery, we should be talking about more and encourage the system to open that up to and help people navigate because we don't have good boundaries when we're using, <laughs> we don't, yeah. we don't, right? So, you know, like we got to help people with that. And it's not just, it's not just work boundaries or using boundaries, friend boundaries, it's relationship, it's love relationship boundaries too. Yeah. 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 I think, um, in my active addiction, boundaries were a foreign word to me. I had no mm -hmm. idea. Even before I had started using them, um, mm -hmm. I had gone through some childhood trauma. Um, so that kind of started my lack of boundaries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, I just yeah. would shove things in and didn't want to talk about anything that was bothering me. You know, protect everyone. Protect. That's all I could think sure. of doing. So then when I before I had come out officially, I had gotten married to a man, was very naive in his active addiction at that time, um, had really no idea about like what kind of drugs or uh, extracurricular activities there were mm -hmm. and how emotionally and verbally abusive that relationship had been. Mm -hmm. My my parents, of course, are always protective and they just mm -hmm. right away could see. Um, but I just didn't want to. I was naive. I didn't want yeah. to see that Yeah. because yeah. I wanted to be loved. Right, right. <laughs> and, um, right. 
I mean, it took a while for me to really realize what was going on. And then I had started using on my own. Well, not on my own, but in that relationship, it was kind of the turning point after we had had a, a couple of kids together. And I think my son was probably just about one and a half. Mm -hmm. That's kind of when I had started using and mm -hmm. uh, become, became an everyday user. Mm -hmm. Uh, cops were getting called because we were fighting all the time sure um, and it just was not healthy and the kids really kind of they don't really remember too much from from that relationship they do remember that it was a lot of fighting and mm -hmm. um a lot of back and forth and um mm -hmm. it just was boundaries that i wasn't setting for my own self or mm -hmm. for my children and um, it became dangerous towards the end. And mm. I finally decided I need to take back my life and, and get, get back to raising my children, even mm. though I'm still using. That's kind of the, the moment where I realized I've known since I was in fourth grade that um, I was attracted to women. Mm. Uh, and I just didn't want to come out about it because mm -hmm. the stigma. Because <laughs> of society. Time. Yeah, because of, of society. That's not yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, I was unhappy, and I realized at one point that why am I going to let society tell me that mm -hmm. my whole life I've been attracted to women that mm -hmm. I I shouldn't be, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. and my parents were. I was kind of like the last one to to know, <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, I kind of joke about that because even mm -hmm. when I was younger. I, uh, was a tomboy, your, your, your typical mm -hmm. tomboy playing sports with the boys across the street, sure. hanging out with the boys, sure. Sure. um, building things with my dad and my parents. Um, when I finally told them, my mom took it a little hard, but she loves me anyway. And she mm -hmm. accepts me for who I am. And my dad, he was just like, mm -hmm. okay, <laughs> like nice. I already knew. Yeah. And, um, we kind of joke about that too. And, Mm -hmm. uh, I'm I'm very 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 blessed to have my parents still in my life even after mm -hmm. active addiction, mm -hmm. um, and coming out. Mm -hmm. I mean I, mm -hmm. I know there's a lot of kids in, uh, the world that don't have that anymore. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Did okay. the. Uh, I have I have two two questions for right. both of you, but Alicia, you you kind of brought it up first. I mean I. <clears throat> work with Mandy so I know more mm -hmm. about Mandy and um so one I'm wondering about substance use and your sexuality mm -hmm. and if there if there's a like when you said you came out when you were young so is there a connection I'm thinking and also both of you were married to men yeah, <laughs> yeah. so yeah. so I'm thinking about that too in terms of did you identify as being bisexual or, or were you both straight and sort of concealing that? And did, and is, does that tie in to substance use and, you know, the stigma, I mean, there's so much stigma with substance use to begin yeah. with. Then if you're gay, there's even more. Yeah. So those are the sort of two questions in my mind, but for both of you, for both of you, cause I'm, I'm curious your views I, on that. Yeah. I think for my not wanting to come out, in a way had kind of created this, like, I need to numb that. I don't want, I don't want the society to tell me mm -hmm. uh, that I, I shouldn't be with someone. And then eventually as I was using, of course, we all kind of get this like in, invincible mindset, I can do anything. Right, right. And, and so while I was using, like, I was like, you know what? my life's kind of crappy right now anyway what's what worse could happen if i just come out with this and <laughs> i, I really, that's great yeah and um so i decided i'm just gonna come out yeah um and and i thought the worst i hoped for the best but i thought mm -hmm. the worst mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. but to have that love from my parents um on the other end of that really mm -hmm. drove me to be willing to be my true self nice. um 
And I mean, of course I still was using a little, I tried to get clean a couple of times on my own after that. Um, and then just wasn't ready. <laughs> yeah. And had, you know, toxic relationships yeah. with women then after yeah. that, right? Because mm -hmm. when you're still using and you don't have healthy boundaries, even though she wasn't with a man or wasn't with the same person anymore, she continued to have these kind of toxic, unhealthy yeah. Yeah. relationships and active addiction, yeah. which part of my story too doesn't matter though right because you're still using so it doesn't really matter <laughs> if you're gay or you're straight you're still going to have toxic relationships if substances are are going to be involved like that right right yeah. right um for me oh man <laughs> i didn't come out all the way until a few years ago i was married to a man when i came out and i identified as bisexual for a long time Mm -hmm. I knew that I was attracted to women mm -hmm. um, and I knew that I preferred women, that I was mm -hmm. more attracted to women. Mm -hmm. um, but man, I had a really hard time and I really didn't come out even fully as bisexual until I was in recovery. I, I dabbled in women in active addiction. I dabbled in everything sure. in active addiction, <laughs> honestly. Um, <laughs> no boundaries. Right, um, right. but, but like became more comfortable with identifying as bisexual in, in early recovery. Um, some of that was because I dated her. And mm -hmm. so it was like, oh, okay, I'm going to be in an actual relationship with a woman. And, right. but man, I really had a hard time coming all the way out, saying it out loud to myself. Mm -hmm. I had built this life. Um, in recovery, um, and, and this is after I dated her and I had, you know, got married to a man in the mm -hmm. rooms, in, you know, in the 12 step mm -hmm. community, mm -hmm. was very well known and very involved in the 12 step community, had built this life and reputation for myself as a woman with a man. And it was really intimidating for me to like, I was like, I'm going to ruin, if I say this out loud to people, like, this is going to ruin my life. If I tell people I'm gay now, this is going to ruin my life. Wow. Um, I was absolutely terrified. I burst into my therapist's office one day and I was like, I have a crush on a woman that I work with and I think I'm gay. And she was like, now we're into the good stuff. Like, let's talk. <laughs> now we can get to work. <laughs> yeah. and, and I waited I mean, we talked through it all mm -hmm. and she was like, Mandy, because I thought that I just had a lot of trauma with men and that maybe that's what was oh, creating my attraction like, for women. Like, like pushing you away from, from yes. men. Got it. Okay. Yep. We talked that through a lot and she was like, Mandy, I mm -hmm. am a trauma therapist and I have worked mm -hmm. with a lot of women who have had mm -hmm. significant trauma with men. Mm -hmm. and are still attracted to men to men right, right. that's that's not right. the issue and right. I waited probably a week of like processing what coming out to everybody was gonna do mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. for my life or to my life I really looked at all kind of all the mm -hmm. aspects mm -hmm. before I finally went home and had the I mean having that conversation with my husband was one of the hardest conversations I've ever had in my life to sit down and say like, you know, it's not you, it's me, you know, no, really I'm gay. Like, it was like, uh, mm. I, it, how do you tell somebody that ha really has mm. no idea, mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. know, and say, I want mm -hmm. a divorce mm. and I moved out the next day and the next day COVID shut everything down. And so, oh, wow. but wow. I can tell you that it goes into one of the hard things about being in relationships in recovery with other people in the recovery community. Mm -hmm. When I came out, like, and we got divorced, I went to totally different 12 step meetings to like, a. I went from sure. NA to AA. Sure, sure. Um, uh, and, and eventually stopped going to 12 step meetings 
-hmm. just because of how how it was perceived the mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. and, and not not because of stigma not necessarily because mm -hmm. i'm gay but just because you build these relationships with people under a different mm -hmm. pretense and they knew us as a couple and they right. all got used to that and when right. you have a breakup that's kind of public in your community of people yeah. it really shakes everything up and it can be yeah. It can be destructive to people's recoveries when that happens. I'm really sure. grateful that I had a really firm foundation and that I have people in recovery that I am still good friends with and that I had therapy and I had all of these other tools. Um, because had that happened and I was in early recovery and I didn't feel like I could continue going to meetings, where am I at then? Do I go back to active addiction? Because that's what I know. Right. So I think that is one of the reasons that be really careful and cautious when you get into relationships with other people in the same 12 step room that you're going to, if that's how your recovery path, because yeah. it can be really destructive. Yeah. yeah. When life happens. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. That's, um, <laughs> I'm wondering if, did you, so <laughs> you moved out and then you said, the COVID shutdown happened the next day. Did you, yeah. did you have any sort of thoughts around like, oh my gosh, the world, the world, I, I, I came out in the world, the I world did. shut down. I did, I did. I was, um, yeah. oh my gosh, it just like, yeah. it's so crazy looking back because yeah. my my whole world changed and the rest of the whole world changed, world changed. right at the same time. Right, but honestly. Me going through that at the time when COVID was shut down, honestly, even though I have a lot of anxiety around life now because of COVID and mental health and all of that, mm -hmm. I think it gave me a really good opportunity to look inward mm. and to really become who I am today. Mm. Mm. as a woman, as a member of the LGBTQ community to become mm -hmm. comfortable and confident in that, in who I am authentically kind of separate from everybody else because mm -hmm. everything was so shut down. Right. Like it allowed me to, mm. to do the work. Yeah. Yeah. More introspection. Yeah. Then the outward impact of coming out. If COVID didn't happen, you would be interacting with a lot more people. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. How, how have your families taken to all of this? And, and, and it, when I say all of this, I mean both things. I mean, recovery and then your relationship. And you recently got engaged. So congratulations. <laughs> congratulations on that. Yeah. And 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 the family, you know, how 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 does that how does that all interact? Because I know for myself, being in recovery, not everybody in my family is supportive of that. Yeah. I mean, it sounds odd, you know, when when you say it, but that's the truth because they got their own stuff and they don't like the reflection of a person who's made those sort of choices and changes. So how's that been for the both of you? Yeah. Um, for me, it's kind of funny when I, so when I came out, when I told, I came over to my mom's house and I told my mom, um, uh, Josh and I are getting a divorce. Um, I'm, I'm gay. And she like, she literally for, looked at me and was like, it's just a phase. And I was like, Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, that's really funny. Um, she, you know, she moved past it and yeah. things are really good now. And she's very supportive. And I, I really didn't get a lot of like pushback from anybody in my family with regards to that. I think they were more shocked about the divorce piece. Like, I think if mm. there hadn't been the end of a marriage at mm. the same time as me coming out, mm -hmm. there probably wouldn't have been that weird, like it's a phase thing, but I think mm -hmm. she didn't know how to process the divorce because she loved my husband. He was a member of our family, family yeah. TV that comes with the end of a marriage. Yeah. Um, in terms of recovery, I mean, that's a kind of a hard thing for 
my family was very supportive um, because they knew what I was like in active addiction and, mm -hmm. you know, that they were very supportive. Mm -hmm. That being said, there's a lot of substance use in my family. And so it's been a roller coaster. My mom got sober for a while, um, went back out. Um, there was, you know, situations this winter, you know, with her being in the hospital and overdose, and she's now entering recovery again. So I'm super proud of her. Mm -hmm. But so it's been really this roller coaster with my family um, of trying to be supportive to them and make connections and also holding back to protect myself and our family when I have family members that are using like there's not a ton of there's not a ton of spending time with that side of my family um for that reason there's a little okay. more now because my mom is sober but mm -hmm. but there was a good chunk of time in our relationship that we didn't spend a lot of time together because mm -hmm. we just can't yeah yeah you know as far as like with my family my dad um was a part of a, a different kind of 12-step program and um mm -hmm. so he kind of really understood where i was at Mm -hmm. And um, he he's pretty good about reminding me like mm -hmm. there's there's things that you got to pay attention to um, mm -hmm. and and hearing Mandy talk about her relationship with her family, man, I am again so very very blessed to have the relationship I have with my parents. Mm -hmm. um, it brings me back to the word unconditional. Like mm -hmm. there's some families that have conditions whether they see it or yes. not. They might, yes. say, they might say, I'm going to love you unconditionally, whether you're using or not. But right. here's the condition is that right. I'm going to love you if you stop using. Mm -hmm. My parents, they were warned a little bit by other people in the community that I was using. Mm -hmm. But they loved me unconditionally. Mm -hmm. um, and after I got clean and, and started really taking a stand in my recovery, they just were the biggest support for me. And um, I could, I, I definitely know that I would not be in the position that I am today without having their unconditional love. That's great. Um, and as far as, uh, you know, coming out to them and, and even with my children, it, it just kind of, my children were still pretty young. Um, so they kind of were just like, oh, this is, this is normal. This is mm -hmm. how our life is. Right. I had gotten into a couple of pretty severe abusive relationships when I was using. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of the point where it took me away from my family. Um, I was trying to hide, you know, bruises and, and mm -hmm. things, especially uh, when they were noticeable. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I, I really, some days I kind of struggle with that being uh being able to see scars every day like mm -hmm. i i have a scar on the side of my face that i mm -hmm. i see every day and and it it kind of in the beginning of my recovery reminded me these are the things i don't want i i mm -hmm. can't allow my myself to be okay with waking up with a a new scar and i just right. kind of set myself in that position to not allow that to happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so then um, after we had dated the first time, I had found um, a different relationship, um, you know, and it was, it was fun. We had a really good time. Mm -hmm. uh, it just, there was still some stuff missing. And I mm -hmm. think the boundaries and, and the being honest with each other every day mm -hmm. um, is what was really missing. We were just kind of, surface level for a long period of time to be honest um mm. we had been together for four years and then all of a sudden um this person was starting to use again and that really it it hurt me pretty mm -hmm. bad sure. um and i really had to ask myself at that point like where is my boundary with this mm -hmm. semester and Congratulations. Um, 
Thank you. If if I didn't have the support from my family and um, really the the support from her at that time, I I, I probably would have given in on mm -hmm. those boundaries mm -hmm. and um, would have been okay with uh, using every once in a while. And mm -hmm. um, I just really now today I encourage everyone, even if it it you want to look away from it, mm -hmm. like you set your boundary and you keep it right and you hold each other accountable yeah yeah and i yeah. think that's just um really important for the relationship that mandy and i have now yeah mm -hmm. we kind of were both kind of going through a little bit of a heartbreak at the same time when COVID happened yeah mm -hmm. so it, it required us to sh shut down and and mm -hmm. not be around many people yeah um and and then we we reconnected again mm -hmm. and um i think that's really where it was important to yeah. understand that here's our boundaries and I'm going to set them now before we even get any further. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, yeah. right. We were both yeah. really patient with ourselves, mm -hmm. with ourselves yeah. mm -hmm. and, and with each other. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, you had asked too about like, how that kind of stuff, our relationship and being in recovery and all of that, like the effects that that has on our kids too. Mm -hmm. um, and I can tell you that they, in the early days of our, of this relationship, mm -hmm. this time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. there was a lot of conversations around, from our kids around noticing that our relationship was healthier than other relationships that they had seen. Uh -huh. you know been a part of that oh right. you guys don't yell at each other all the time you're not mm -hmm. you know calling my mom bad names and you're there's right. you know you're not throwing things and there's not you guys aren't wasted and, you know and mm -hmm. there was just this they noticed mm -hmm. our kids noticed the difference um which sucks <laughs> you know that that they have those experiences to compare this to but sure. that they notice and that's right. allowed us to have really great conversations with them and they're really open mm -hmm. with us about what's going on in their life you know our mm -hmm. it's not easy to have two moms and to mm -hmm. not really have a dad yeah. figure yeah. in your life and our kids talk about that you know kids kids want to assume that because we're gay that you know our kids are gay and it it doesn't work like that. Which, which, which when you said that in warmups, uh, that that really, I've never heard that before. Um, yeah. That's very interesting. Yeah. I mean, I do commend this younger generation right now. They are authentic to yeah. the bone, yeah. every piece of yeah. them. And yeah. I just love watching that. And um, uh, it just makes me so happy to know that like, at least in our house, we're talking about these things. Yeah. They're they're young kids, yeah. you know. Yeah. And um it it these are the types of conversations that I knew that I wanted to have with them mm -hmm. uh well before they were ever thought of. And yeah. then when you know I started my active addiction, I always was like, oh my gosh, what am I creating for them? Like, what kind of trauma am I creating? for them right, and I still right. struggle with that today sure. um, you know their trauma that they have from right. my active addictions and seeing yeah. me um watching me get abused and and bleeding mm -hmm. <laughs> from my head they watch that sure and um I always try to remember like children these days are authentically themselves and they're resilient and they're going to forgive me they already have. Mm -hmm. And it really created this bond between really all four of us that mm -hmm. shows them that the type of relationship that Mandy and I have right now, mm -hmm. um, I honestly could say is probably one of the more healthier, healthier relationships I've seen from a group of people together anyway. Yeah. Even in our even in other people that we know, we yeah. have a it's good. We don't, we don't fight and argue all the time. We don't, 
we talk about our disagreements. We have really open conversations with our kids. Yeah. Even if I'm being stubborn, I still, <laughs> still That's great. Yeah. It's different than anything yeah. I think yeah. for sure that I've experienced before in yeah. my life. Oh yeah. 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 That's great. Never, I just don't have time for the fighting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Old yeah. For that. I'm tired. Yeah. So, so, so when's the big day? Did you guys pick a pick a date? When's the big date? We have not picked a date yet, just because we're kind of in this um, area of we're trying to buy a house first. Yes. Ah, okay. yeah. We're gonna buy a house first, and once right. we have, then we'll set a date. Yeah. Okay. Doing right. things backwards. Yeah. Way it's backwards. Not... Most of my life has kind of been. Way yeah. Backwards. That's, that's... <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. That's an exciting thing too, buying a house. That's yeah, very is. exciting. Yeah. Stressful. It's definitely going to, you know, kind of test our relationship again. Yep. It, I mean, sure. it already is. For sure. Um, For but sure. But just understanding, okay, here's what we're going to do. Right. If I don't like something, we just have to agree or, or at least talk about it. Yeah. 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 Um, and yeah. same with her conversations about finances and big yeah. money loans like that yeah um, oh yeah we had lots of conversations yeah. about this yeah and we're, and we're doing well we're yeah. doing well with it but um buying a house could break some people man yeah. there are some conversations i have had <laughs> yep. in the last you know yep. couple of months that i could not have had in yep. other relationships it just there's yeah. a lot to consider there's oh, a lot to consider the house the layout do you like this do you like that yeah right. yeah yeah what we can afford what we can't afford what yeah. we're gonna have to give up yeah 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 <laughs> yeah yep. yeah well i wish you both the best of luck with that it's exciting mm -hmm. to get your own house and i had that experience a few years ago and it's it's very exciting so yeah that's we're great excited. yeah we are yeah, and we're yeah. excited to get married too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. yeah. yeah. Good. That'll be fun. <laughs> well, let us know when the big when the big day oh, yeah. is. We you will. Know. I yeah. you'll be nice to know. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> my time off request. Yeah. <laughs> oh, there you go. Yeah. Well, good. Well, thank you so much for for coming on and being so open and honest. I think it's really important. I think, like I said in the beginning, I just think that. We need to have, as people in recovery, when I say we, people in recovery, we need to talk about these things. We need to talk about relationships. And it doesn't matter whether they're gay relationships or straight relationships, that we just need to be more open about it and talk about it. Because it's like, you know, you go to meetings, it's like the dirty little secret, you know, <laughs> everybody's in relationships. But then, hey, we're not supposed to talk about this, but it's still going on. Mm -hmm. And how do we do that? Um, you know, in a healthy way, in a productive way. So yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me because um, I really, I take pride in, in being able to speak about my recovery and where I'm at today. And, um, you know, it's always kind of been my thought, even with my childhood trauma that um, one mm -hmm. day I want to be able to tell my story. And, and so I Excellent. appreciate you letting me yeah. do that. So. Yeah, yeah. Well, you could come on, uh, you know, when we're doing a different topic, you know, yeah, you can come on and yeah, course. we're always looking, we're always looking for guests and people who are willing to open up and, and share some of their life with others. Cause yeah, that's what it's all about. Hearing other people's stories of hope and inspiration and what's yeah. possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Good. And Mandy, thank you. Yeah. Like my <laughs> podcast co-host. So thanks for, for being vulnerable and coming on. Yeah. Yeah. All right. And to you, the listener, thank you very much for tuning in once again to Recovery Talks podcast from Montana's Peer Network. Every week we release another podcast where we talk about recovery topics. And again, this month of February, we're doing relationships. So tune in each week on our website or we're also on SoundCloud. Thank you. Recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery works, recovery is possible. Recovery is possible. <laughs> recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery works and recovery is possible. Recovery is possible.